Uh, oh. So welcome everyone to this morning's webinar on leadership lessons from a global health crisis, from the pandemic to the climate emergency. It's a great honor to present to you at uh, today's World Federation of Public Health Association's Global Public Health Week, um, and to share um, learning and reflections from the pandemic. So this is this presentation is based on a book uh, that uh, came out last year. Um, so I'm sharing with you the main findings. And the the, the book, as with many, uh, were written um, at the height of the pandemic um, and uh, sort of during the, the whole process um, and acts as a, a reflection on what sort of leadership lessons we actually need for the future, not only to prevent future pandemics, but also so that we can learn those lessons, ideally to address and prevent uh, more substantial global, global security um, challenges, including the planetary emergency with the climate crisis um, and biodiversity, biodiversity emergency. So, um, so firstly, just to say a little bit about myself and what the, uh, the experience I bring to this. Um, so I'm a medical doctor by background, uh, pr professionally trained in public health, uh, where I've worked for much of my career in senior roles in the UK government with the World Health Organization and also with the Commonwealth. And then um, presently, I, um, I'm a strategic advisor for something called the Interaction Council um, and director for the digital platform for Planet, People and Peace, which is kindly hosted uh, today, uh, the, the webinar by, by them, um, and chair of a group on existential threats um, to humanity with the World Academy of Art and Science. So firstly, a little of the context. So the Interaction Council is a, a group of former heads of government. It was established in the 1980s um, by uh, Jim Callahan from the UK, um, Helmut Schmidt from uh, Germany, um, the, Ger the uh, Japanese uh, PM of the time, as well as um, Pierre Trudeau from uh, uh, Canada. So the main focus um, across the years has been on how do we strengthen global security for sustainable development and prosperity across the world. And it's uh, strong principles on multilateralism to achieve solutions. Um, and uh, one of the founding um, uh, pieces of work was on a universal declaration uh, of responsibilities. And they've done a lot of work behind the scenes on non-nuclear proliferation. However, in the last uh, 10 years or so, they've had an increasing focus on the role that health played, plays in terms of global security. So especially after um, the Ebola crisis, um, and now increasingly with um, the planetary health emergency um, and the pandemic, where I've had the um, honor and opportunity to be their main advisor in these areas. Um, and this book, in essence, builds upon a series of reports, high level expert meetings um, and plenary discussions with the senior politicians uh, and uh, shared with policymakers, think tanks um, and experts from around the world. So firstly, I just want to reflect on um, the recent uh, number of deaths that we have officially from the World Health Organization. Um, the, the most recent figures show a total of, uh, of uh, reported 7 million deaths related to COVID uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. A huge question ultimately is, were these deaths preventable? And I hope that this book um, will answer some of those questions for you. When we're looking at global security, um, the challenges from um, in this century are substantially different to that of last of the last century. So we've seen um, an increase in the number of pandemics uh, that actually destabilize global security. So not just health security, but about the influence that pandemics and the climate emergency can have 
on destabilizing our overall global security. So aside from the lives lost, there's been a, a substantial uh, impact on GDP. Um, but also we've seen um, really negative consequences, for example, a re reversal on the uh, sustainable development goals, life expectancies slip backwards in many places as well. Um, but it's also created uh, political destabilization. Um, and we'll reflect a little bit more on that during the presentation. How's that influenced uh, the rise of some of the current uh, dictatorships and, and so on, for example? So it ultimately, learning the lessons from from this pandemic is really key for us to be able to reflect on what went wrong how could we improve it for the future to enhance and strengthen global security ultimately we all need a secure world for for us um, to survive and exist so let's have an overview of the book um so the first half of the book uh it, um, goes through the main challenges. Uh, so I'll take each chapter in turn. Um, but it not only goes through the kind of uh, what actually happened and reflects on some of those lessons for leaders, it also looks at, it tries to answer the why. Why did this happen? And creates a, a deeper understanding um, going forward. Um, and that's where it's different from a lot of other books. Um, it, it's not just a narrative of, of the unfolding um, disaster, but it actually tries to give insight as to why, and therefore, in the second half of the book, what we can do to rectify those problems and to prevent pandemics going into the future. What are the key lessons? then in terms of dealing with other emergencies with a particular focus on the planetary emergency. Um, and then to the to the end of the book, what, what do we need to do to cultivate courageous leaders uh, individually into the future? But then in, in terms of the last chapter, what does that mean for governance? Um, and how do we strengthen gov governance mechanisms? So for chapter one, what did we learn from the pandemic? Ultimately, we saw this as a crisis of leadership. Um, throughout the book, I've tried to uh, not point fingers or be overly critical on individuals. I've looked at what were the uh, repeated patterns throughout um, this process, because actually we're all humans. We're all subject to error. <laughs> We all do things that are wrong, especially when we're in an emergency and in a panic situation. So if we really want to learn how to rectify it in the future, we have to acknowledge that, you know, that we're all human um, and leaders are human as well. So to make it constructive, I've looked at patterns of behavior and commonalities so that we have insight so that we can adjust and change that for the future. So when we look at some of those repeat patterns uh, of what actually happened. We can see at the beginning of the pandemic um, that actually there were a, a handful of countries that did very well in terms of their response to the pandemic, especially those that were uh, close to China. Um, they had been well practiced with the SARS um, and had um, modern and robust public health systems. Um, and they went for approaches and strategies that were around uh, elimination or low prevalence. And they actually managed to contain um, the pandemic very successfully uh, early on in the, uh, in the process. However, we saw also um, as the as the pandemic uh, spread to to Europe and other parts of the world, um, other countries that we might have thought would be well prepared because they've got historically good public health systems, actually the pandemic um, came out of control um, and and spread uh, at a pace that was uncontrollable. Um, ultimately, the narratives matched. The, that sense of uh, the pandemic being out of control um, and shifted to essentially a riskier approach, one where the, the narrative was about, you know, learning to live with it, even about having herd immunity. Um, and ultimately, that shaped the rest of how the rest of the world was able to uh, deal or not deal with the pandemic. Um, and that's why I describe it as an imperialist um, narrative, 
because a handful of key countries ended up dominating um, by default, even if it wasn't strategic as such, um, what happened in the rest of the world. Um, and what we saw was a very high risk approach with rolling pandemics, um, a high cost in terms of the economy, but also in terms of human life and tragedy. Um, this also allowed unknown new variants uh, and the impacts from long COVID, which we still um, don't really fully appreciate and understand. Um, although the pandemic seems to be in its sort of uh, um, sort of lower stages of prevalence, um, the, the long term impacts from long COVID are, are still really unknown. And there's still the risk of new variants emerging, uh, creating a whole fresh uh, kind of wave of, of pandemic. So the, unfortunately, a handful of countries taking this approach meant that we were unable ultimately to take a, a sort of a global pandemic um, kind of strategic or a, a planned approach to actually have, in essence, an exit strategy, um, which would have been much safer uh, and averted this whole disaster. Um, we know that we've done this in the past with other pandemics. When we've acted early, we've actually been able to avert pandemics and we could may well have done so with this one. So the, the importance is that we learn as much in terms of what went wrong so that we can act quick, much more swiftly in the future to avert uh, future pandemics going forward. <coughs> so this slide um, illustrates the, um, the balance between uh, different political perspectives and their public health measures and how that played out um, in different countries and globally. So some countries really emphasised uh, human rights um, and that influenced then the, the uh, type of public health measures that were uh, pushed. So it was all about protecting yourself. Um, and um, if anything, it, it, it would be, you know, that you've got a right to still do things, you know, whether it's travel or to, to carry on with, with your life. Um, and th those rights often predominated um, the, the protection of others um, and the, the, the and that influenced ultimately the spread of the infection to others. Um, whilst the other countries that emphasized politically responsibilities tended to do better. So they they had a strong narrative about protecting others and um, you know your personal responsibility as well in terms of not letting the infection spread. Um, so ultimately though, um, even though the countries that focus more on responsibilities, um, you need a, a combination of that narrative. You can see I've just kind of divided the type of the different public health measures that fit into both. From a public health perspective, you know, we needed all of those measures. Um, but it's important to know what the how the political narrative um, alters public health messaging and to be really quite um, nuanced in terms of which messages go down um, better in a, a particular political context. Ultimately, we need swift action, though. So it's a, a case of trying to get as many measures that are acceptable to your population and your political setup as possible. Um, so, and I think one of the key things ultimately, though, going forward is about the importance of responsibility at a global level for global health security and the key message of no one is safe until we are all safe. So we do need to take responsibility for our health individually as a country, but also globally if we are all to be healthy. So ultimately we can reflect on whether the pandemic was a disaster waiting to happen. So when we look back before the pandemic, um, there are a number of uh, um, studies that looked at um, the, the, the sort of potential risk of pandemics um, and virtually all of them placed uh, pandemics as a high risk um, and a high impact uh, uh, event, um, i.e. Most people in the profession, in the public health profession, knew that pandemics were going to happen at some point. It was, it was really a case of when. 
Um, and we were also aware that this could be a really high impact event. So it, it was essentially something we knew that was going to happen. So the question then is, if we knew something of, you know, that this pandemic could be seen as relatively small in its overall impact. But we knew, you know, we, we should have been really well prepared. We knew that there was going to be a pandemic. There will be further pandemics in the future. That's, you know, that's something we can easily learn from history. So the question then is, why do we spend so little on the, our public health budget? So the average amount of the overall health budget is only about 3% on public health. Um, and even though the pandemic spread in countries where there were relatively good public health services, they've been allowed to um, deteriorate and been uh, disinvested in um, over the years. So they weren't fully uh, in a state of preparedness. And this is something that was very much acknowledged uh, by the uh, WHO uh, Director General, um, Ted Ross, um, at, in his report to the World Health Assembly halfway through the pandemic. Ultimately, we were underfunded, underprepared, uh, with increasing risks and demands. So not enough spent on public health um, services and capacity, um, especially on modernising those. And even halfway through the pandemic, um, only 70 countries had actually developed national action plans for health security. Um, and in the meantime, the WHO was also responding to many other emergencies and disasters and hazards. So ultimately, we can say this was a pandemic that was waiting to happen. It was a disaster waiting to happen. Ultimately, therefore, we should have been better prepared. And going forward, we need to be better prepared. So um, the graph on the, the uh, right hand side is on the World Economic Forum uh, Global Risks Report. They also, so th this is essentially evidence that the wider community, the political community, it wasn't just the health community, also knew about these risks. So some of the key lessons uh, that have come out from big international reports as well are kind of summarised in uh, the book. Um, so there have been a number of independent reports, uh, including the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board uh, and the report, the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. And um, both of these uh, have informed and shaped um, high level expert meetings um, that have also informed this book. So on the right hand side is essentially a very high level summary of what are the key findings and they fall into two camps. One is governance, uh, the need for strong gov global governance as well as uh, national governance and a, a key recommendation um, that came out of that was the development of a global health threats council, um, something that still has not been established. Uh, the main focus has been on um, uh, the development of a pandemic treaty which will uh, see uh, hopefully will go through in process later this year at the World Health Assembly. So there are some efforts to um, address the, 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 the governance challenges. However, ultimately, you'll see as we go forward, the need to have something that's um, uh, that is cross cutting across uh, the the international community um, will be definitely very beneficial to protect us from fu future pandemics. And then the other key recommendation, which is of no surprise at all, is the need to strengthen public health systems across the board in terms of uh, investment um, and capacity uh, um, of, uh, and development of modern services. So in terms of chapter three, then, uh, this is an analysis of uh, past pandemics um, and future threats to health, life, and existence. This means the existence of humanity and ultimately whether pandemics and other uh, issues are uh, existential threats to, to human life um, going forward. So this is a, a summary diagram um, <coughs> that kind of pulls together all of those threats uh, under people. That's the risk from um, past and uh, from of future pandemics. If we look historically, um, 
ultimately past pandemics have been uh, really significant in terms of uh, their impact. You know, whether it's the, the plague, which uh, knocked out a third of the population across Europe, um, or measles and influenza, which um, devastated populations across uh, the Americas, potentially killing 98% of all of the, those populations, and really illustrates how being exposed to a new virus that without immunity um, can actually have devastating impacts on populations and can be existential in the terms of their nature. Um, we were lucky with COVID, maybe only one in a thousand of the global population was killed from this. Um, it could be, it could be, and it could have been a lot worse. Um, and that's something we need to really be prepared for in the future. In terms of future pandemic threats, in particular, the risk of synthetic pandemics, uh, i.e. laboratory-based ones where alterations in DNA uh, are occurring, um, are a real risk. Um, they um, could spread either via um, lab escape, i.e. not non-intentionally, or they could be weaponized, more importantly, and actually intentionally create a pandemic. And the governance around uh, the risk of future pandemics in this domain really needs to be strengthened. At the moment, it just depends on individual countries um, and the sort of laboratory regulations uh, within those countries. Uh, so this is an area that really needs uh, further attention and needs to be on the global security kind of radar. Um, the other areas in this diagram as well uh, that we'll sort of go through a little bit more in tomorrow's presentation on existential threats include the planetary emergency, uh, the continued threat from uh, nuclear uh, war and conflict, and um, the threats from uh, AI uh, and emerging technology. Um, ultimately, each of these tend to interact and make um, the whole situation more fragile um, and, and worse overall. And you could really see that being played out in the pandemic, how it actually took a step back um, in terms of some of the uh, sustainable development goals and destabilised many political um, regimes uh, and so on. So the next slide really is just a, an emphasis in terms of this book on the impact on the planetary emergency. Um, and th this is partly because this is seen as, you know, a much more serious and fundamental challenge for humanity, for the survival of humanity. And it builds on um, work uh, taken forward with the Interaction Council on a, a manifesto to secure the planet's health, um, which was launched in uh, 2019. Uh, and um, ultimately it, drew on the learning from uh, the health, the, the perspective of health and public health in terms of thinking about the planet's health and how we need to take more of an emergency response um, to actually address the planet's health to ensure ultimately our survival. And we can make an analogy of you know, patient planet going to um, the doctor's surgery and being sent straight to intensive care because of the, the multi-organ um, system failures that were seen uh, occurring. And this is even more um, relevant uh, in today's world um, and will be discussed uh, further in tomorrow's presentation on existential threats. So, we now move to the why. Why did this happen? What's the, the understanding that we can bring to how we as humans, including leaders, because we're all humans, <laughs> responded um, to this pandemic? And a lot of it, it ultimately is about understanding our emotional and survival responses. So firstly, this is just a, a sort of... Um, a diagram that summarizes the repeat patterns of emotional responses that happened during the pandemic that could really be observed. So there, there was a you know a big threat and risks um, that suddenly became huge and present <laughs> in in certain countries, and many um, people and politicians, as they saw the threat. Um, approaching went into denial, even when it was upon them. So there was a whole denial process that was really a very psychological process um, going on. Um, 
then when it was uh, impossible to deny any further, there would often be a, a period of rapid panic, um, what I describe as the headless chicken moment. And, you know, we saw that being played out uh, sort of in terms of, you know, rapid policies being made over the weekend and, um, you know, ill thought through kind of policies emerged from, from that state of panic often. And a lot of coming, going back and forwards in terms of some of those po uh, um, policies. And then the other kind of key uh, pattern that emerged was a, a rising sense of populism. So um, ultimately, you know, countries became more protective. Uh, there was a sort of nationalist sort of push um, in terms of how we responded. Um, and, you know, that was... Uh, kind of that energy was garnered further by uh, politicians. So, you know, the conspiracy theories can almost be seen as part of that process as well. Um, and then the other kind of key pattern, especially in politicians and some of our leaders, was a sense of heroism. Um, and that was often in the case of, you know, the, the brave, heroic leader who could never actually, you know, be infected or uh, wasn't ever going to be subject um to you know a tiny infection um so it was often ill-founded heroism rather than the sort of heroics that are actually needed um to to help us uh, avert such a disaster so looking further into this then um, I looked at so being a doctor, I kind of <laughs> went into sort of, you know, why, why did we see these patterns emerge? And actually, I found that there was a really um, uh, an intriguing overlap and overlay with um, what many of us from a health profession uh, are really familiar with, the survival cascade, which historically has just been the freeze, flight, fright um, kind of process. Uh, and it's really intrinsically wired into not just humans, but, you know, most of animals um, as a survival mechanism. Um, so there's the initial fright, um, which is sort of parallel to the to the risks. Um, and, you know, virtually all animals then go through a process of either sequentially or sort of, you know, one or the other of these mechanisms having going into a freeze mode. So the bunny in the, um, the, the headlights, for example, uh, it's often denial or playing dead um, is a, an important survival mechanism. Um, and then there's the flight in that it's actually better to run now, <laughs> um, but that can also be quite panicky and it can be zigzag kind of running to avert danger. Um, and then there's the actually you're trapped by the bear. <laughs> the best thing you can do is fight. Um, <laughs> And, you know, that sort of fighting sense of energy, you know, may well have uh, underpinned some of the populist um, and sort of nationalist movements and, you know, vaccine nationalism and that sort of protectionist sort of, you know, wanting to protect yourself. And then the last one, which is a relatively new area in the survival cascade is um, described as fawn, fawning, um, which is kind of essentially uh, um, sort of so something that heroic leaders need um, their followers to follow relatively passively, and it's it's a protection mechanism when you're in danger. Um, say when when you've been um, kidnapped, you know people will fawn to sort of not provoke or uh, cause um, an attack, um, and you can see that this fawning mechanism probably led to some of the groupthink and um, some of these dynamics that happened in uh, many leadership circles. So the next chapter then really looks at uh, some of the evolution um, of leadership as well and how uh, this, uh, what we saw was ultimately a mismatch of leadership patterns across the pandemic. Ultimately, we didn't have the type of leaders and leadership that was needed, and it was partly because of the play out of some of these uh, psychological um, and emotional patterns. So if you look from an evolutionary perspective, the purpose of leadership is all about security and coordination. Um, I looked not just at human leadership, but also about animals. Not all animals have leaders because some are, are lone um, animals. So it's only really relevant for group animals like humans. But three main patterns of leadership were uh, observed um, from a um, 
an anthropological perspective, and they include dominance, knowledge, and values. So dominance is the the the, the big chief, the big leader. When there's a, a significant threat um, of attack, whether it's wild animals or an army of people, um, you want to put the biggest person in front of you and you want to be protected as a population. You want to feel secure. Um, so it's actually not surprising that dominance leadership came to a fore during the pandemic because everyone was feeling scared and they wanted to feel safe. So it allowed dominant style leadership patterns to really emerge. Um, and these were often unbalanced. So knowledge leadership traits tend to be more uh, dispersed. So different experts take leadership roles in different areas, and it's about coordination and collaboration, using, you know, evidence and experience to inform practice um, and, and decision. So this tended to be uh, a style that was in some of the successful um, uh, countries, along with uh, strong values as well. Um, and values-based leadership is often uh, more emergent in um, populations that actually have to draw their populations because they're sort of m mobile, maybe, um, and that they have to bring their populations together with a sense of common values. Um, and again, values are really important to help you navigate where you don't quite know where you're going. So you can see that knowledge and values were very, very much uh, a leadership style that was taken forward um, by some of the early successful countries that are described as sort of dynamic in their leadership style. Um, however, as as the pandemic progressed, we saw increasingly a rise of dominant leadership um, style of leadership. And that, on one hand, marginalised other forms of leaders and leadership styles. And then on the other hand, allowed the uprising of essentially very toxic um, power based dictators. Um, and I describe in the book some of those processes of what's described psychologically as a dark triad of characteristics that include narcissism, psychopathy, and uh, sort of Machiavellian abusive behaviour. So one of the other insights as well is about the common patterns of functions of life systems. So again, from a health perspective, this is really useful to sort of help understand that actually, whether it's a um, a cell, um, an a, a multicellular animal, a, um, a community, or a city, a country, or a planet, that we all um, interact in very similar ways with a center, a, a group of coordinators, um, and we all have a a a, a border, um, and when there are threats. Um, the borders tend to go up, whether it's at a cellular level or a country level. Um, and this really helps us understand, you know, why we had increased nationalism. Um, it also helps us understand maybe why conspiracy theories and extra suspicion and suspicious behaviour uh, kind of uh, uh, arose as well. So actually understanding some of these common um, uh, uh, functions of life systems in advance of threats happening helps us to appreciate that actually this is almost to be expected as behavior. So we then need to create measures. The more insight we have, then the more you can counter those uh, tendencies to become very nationalist as a country um, and, and to, you know, to have nationalist vaccine policies, for example, um, and also different ways of dealing with conspiracy theories. Ultimately, going forward, we need to place the boundary around the planet so that we're all in that circle. Um, and the threat is very distinctly seen as, you know, the threat from the virus or something that we are commonly all together collectively addressing and dealing with. So now <clears throat> we'll move to what could we do about this um, and how we can prevent um, pandemics going forward into the future and the role of public health in doing that. So the first thing is to say, actually, we know how to do this. Um, this is a, a framework that I uh, um, 
developed very quickly in the first two months of the pandemic, um, along with the World Federation of Public Health Associations and many other key public health bodies uh, who um, it, uh, endorsed this framework. It was published with the Interaction Council. Essentially, it's basic bread and butter public health um, approaches. It's nothing <laughs> sort of startling. You know, we need good governance and coordination, um, you know, informed by expertise and, you know, values. Um, and th then the pillars are all things that you'll all be really familiar with, surveillance and monitoring, control um, and containing, you know, the actual treatment side of saving lives, and then the wider determinants, community resilience, um, and the importance, especially of, um, of government, um, in terms of making us feel secure and creating stability in our wider uh, economy and lives. And this is all underpinned by good research, uh, recovery plan and the ability to reflect for the future. So th there's nothing startling about this. Um, and, you know, most public health people will be really familiar with this. The bottom line is actually the public health community have the answers. They know what to do. We've dealt with past pandemics um, and the learning is already there, um, but we need to be able to invest and shape that for the future. So um, again, this is a, um, outlined in the book. Uh, it was towards the end of the pandemic, um, essentially mapping out a global exit plan for the pandemic. Um, you've seen many of the reasons <laughs> that have prevented a global response from happening. Um, one of the startling things out of this pandemic is that there was really never a global plan. Um, and, you know, a global plan would have really helped um, if we'd, you know, if key countries and regions and in the international community had a plan already in place that was adaptable, flexible, um, to be able to navigate uh, whatever came at us, um, that would have actually really, really been very instrumental in us being able to prevent um, th this pandemic and ones in the future. So this again is just sort of outlining, we know what to do already uh, in terms of health systems and uh, public health. Uh, a lot of the work has already been done. I just want to really mention as well that a lot of this work is based on um, work done in collaboration with the World Federation of Public Health Associations through the uh, Global Charter for the Public's Health um, that came out in uh, uh, 2016. Um, I worked closely with them at that time based on work that I'd been doing in the WHO on public health uh, system strengthening and then developed tools in my role in the Commonwealth uh, to actually apply this in terms of how to strengthen uh, policies um, and uh, services um, within the context of universal health coverage. And a key component of that, and there's a number of publications already, uh, were about how do you actually strengthen uh, global global health security and health protection systems. So we've got roadmaps and tools and lots of things that already exist about how we can strengthen public health. It needs political commitment and it needs investment. So what are the key lessons for the planetary emergency? Um, so we can think of this in terms of the, the kind of political uh, learning. Um, as well as the sort of practical side. So from a political um, perspective, it's, it's ultimately, you know, we can reflect on the importance of balancing um, the, the sort of dynamics between rights and responsibilities and really pushing those narratives where they really help open doors and leverage action in different countries according to their um, focus. So under rights, rather than it just all being about me um, and the individual or nationalism, we can be framing that very much as the rights of future generations, the rights of our children and our grandchildren to have a life. Um, whilst uh, countries and uh, political narratives that are more focused on responsibilities, we can also be pushing more around the we, um, the importance of global goods, health as a global good, the environment as a global good, for example, water, clean air as a global goods. Um, and this is also really underpins much of the approach for multilateral collaborative action that is essential to have 
a, 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 a global to have global security and to secure ultimately a healthy planet for everyone. From a professional point of view, though, and what what are the implications for public health? So a key aspect of this is about um, taking learning from addressing emergencies, health emergencies, to thinking about how can we address the emergency of the health of the planet. Um, and this is some work that I've uh, advanced, uh, particularly with the, um, the, the Commonwealth Centre for Digital Health um, and the Platform for Planet, Place and People, which is uh, going to be shortly relaunched as the Platform for Planet, People and Peace. But ultimately, it's a case of taking the, the learning of from a systems wide perspective um, and to shift more to not just a one health system, uh, but a one planet health system. And I think this is a you know, really key to the future direction of public health going forward. So not only the, in terms of how we uh, deliver that um, as uh, in terms of services on the ground, but there's much room for transformation um, with the sort of co-emergence of the, the digital revolution. Um, and, you know, some of the key successes that came out of um, the, the pandemic were, did involve the sort of uh, the the interaction with the digital revolution, whether it was having online Zoom meetings and things that, like what we're doing now, um, really helped to sort of transform the way that we interact, um, you know, at a community level, but importantly at global level. Um, and some of the background thinking that um, we uh, developed uh, with the uh, platform for planet uh, people. Um, and uh, place is outlined here in terms of not only is this learning relevant for health systems, it's also relevant for um, one planet health systems as well for the environment. And th this is essentially the, the health system and the health protection kind of um, kind of component of that health system mapped out with the relevant uh, um, uh, digital tools that already exist um, that uh, have been applied um, ultimately to help um, bring about global goods for transforming the way we address pandemics um, and the planetary emergency. So this is an ongoing piece of work that's being developed um, with, with uh, the platform for planet uh, people and peace, which will be launched shortly uh, in June. Um, and it builds on a number of publications. Uh, I'm hoping Chamika can put the link as well um, and the uh, launch date in the chat for you all as well. Um, so, so basically, it's sort of looked at, you know, the, the challenges of pandemics, collated key tools that already exist uh, for um, pandemics and health. It's also looked at kind of the ex existing tools um, for the climate crisis and our planetary emergency. Um, and it's collating those now on a, a an updated, modernized platform uh, to bring all of those tools together across a wider one planet health system that is also able to address existential threats um, and challenges for the future. So what are the implications then for leadership? Um, and this is as much for political leaders as it is for public health leaders. Um, so we'll go back and just sort of reflect on that sort of rather messy emotional response that we saw earlier in the book. Um, and actually understanding how we act in stressful, life-threatening situations is really key, I think, for, few, for, for future leaders of all sorts, so that we can actually um, take a balanced approach between the science and arts in terms of our skill set. On the science side, if we know that this is a pattern that happens, we can, when we're calm, we can look at risks, we can be prepared, we can be strategic, um, we can actually be looking at the risks for the future with sort of foresight analysis. Um, and we have plans in place. <laughs> it's not that difficult, okay? But we need to do it when we're not in a, a state of emergency or panic or under uh, duress or threat. 
So that's the scientific side. We have loads of knowledge. We know how to do loads of this, but we actually need to do it. And we need political leaders to actually give the support to not dismantle some of these institutions that actually have this as, as a um, responsibility. And then in terms of the arts, we need to um, know about some of the, the emotional patterns so that we can navigate some of the um the the negative aspects like dominance behavior that and populism that actually undermines our global efforts um to address threats that affect us at a global level um so we need to be really aware of that but we can also sort of use some of those skills to good effect we need to to acknowledge that people want to feel safe when they're under threat so it's actually important to um, have a narrative that is about safety, is about security, um, but it's not scapegoating other countries or others in the process. Um, and, you know, dominant behaviour actually is actually important in, a, in an emergency. You need, to, as a country, for somebody to take charge, um, you know, and that's why you need a head of government in charge um, in terms of addressing a, a significant threat of a like a pandemic or the pantry emergency so that there's a, a sense of um a, overall direction and security in the process but it needs to be balanced with the science and the planning and the, the sort of expertise so it's not just down to one person and ideally this is a very mature leader who's calm courageous able to communicate well and collaborate with others and to accept to ultimately express heroicism in all the best possible forms that we need so and then this diagram revisits um the kind of the fundamental purpose of leadership in terms of how we've evolved uh, as animals and humans and about turning on its head the um the the balance between uh, dominance knowledge and values as key drivers for uh for, for leadership um as it emerges especially when we're in a threat or in an emergency situation ultimately as i said we need to to acknowledge that some degree of dominant behavior is useful because it makes people feel safe it can help with fast and uh, coordinated action and you know many successful health protection um outbreaks have been dealt with because they have very kind of you know a military style in terms of coordinating information and action and a kind of a, co a common framework so we need to acknowledge that but we need to be able to um, create balance uh, and checks to prevent the rise of uh, essentially toxic um, uh, leaders that are, that are essentially power-based and become dictators. And we've seen how that negatively has played out in, in the world since the pandemic as well. Now, ideally, you need robust knowledge, as I've said, in terms of the scientific skill set and being able to interpret and draw upon expertise in that process to allow a flexible and a dynamic approach that's adaptable to different situations as well. So it's not a rigid form of knowledge. But ultimately, as well, placing values at the top, I think, is really key, because if you have common values between different countries that you agree of, uh, as, a, as part of your global plan, then this can help you navigate differences of actual um, uh, processes within individual countries. You're all working towards common values and a, a common goal. Um, moreover, values can really help you navigate when you don't really know what you need to do. So the knowledge is imperfect. It usually is in an emergency. But if you have a strong values based in term, agreed values as part of your leadership, then that helps you navigate um, and overcome many of those difficulties, including how to address dom emerging dominance behavior as well. So this slide um, just outlines uh, the, the, the those key uh, leadership areas um ultimately going forward we need to be actively training um our our current and future leaders and embedding some of these uh skills um 
and processes within our workforce planning and our training um, programs. And that includes uh, with, within the public health professional community. Um, I hope to follow up with the World Federation of Public Health Associations um, in doing so. And this is something I'm actively working on and we'll talk about a bit more tomorrow as well. Um, and then lastly, we come to um, how do we strengthen governance, uh, future-proofing global security for people and planet? Ultimately, we can't rely on an individual or a handful of leaders coming forward in an emergency uh, uh, such as the pandemic uh, who essentially save the day. So, you know, Gordon Brown is seen as the saviour of the day for the financial crisis. But if he hadn't stood up <laughs> and created that leadership globally, then you know we could still be in a, a different situation financially. And what we saw with the pandemic was that actually nobody really was there. There was a there was a gap in terms of an individual coming forward, um, and you know partly because of the whole context that we've been through. Um, so what do we need to do? We actually need to establish governance mechanisms, i.e systems that are in place along with plans that actually mean that it doesn't rely on an individual so ideally this is kind of coming back to the idea of a security council like a health threats security council but i've expanded that to be more around um, a security council for people and planet and you'll see tomorrow this is further expanded to address existential threats basically when we're dealing with such threats to human existence that we need a global governance mechanism that um, allows rapid coordination and communication based on decisions that are based on knowledge um, and preparedness and, pl and plans. Um, you see the pillars, the, they're, they're pillars that you're familiar with from a public health perspective, um, and that needs to be supported by a, a, some, something like a one planet health system enabled through digital transformation and um, with a skilled um, and modern leadership to actually be able to address these challenges going forward. Um, and then this is uh, essentially a, a governance framework, an adaptable framework that outlines those main headings in a systems-based format, including governance, knowledge, advocacy, and capacity. And in the middle, you've got the kind of, you know, the human security aspects of people, peace, uh, prosperity and planet and this is something again i'll talk more tomorrow about that's been taken forward uh with the uh, digital health team in the commonwealth center for digital health but we really welcome other partners because we can't do it on our own so anyone who's interested in taking forward many of these uh recommendations uh which i'll outline quickly here before we stop for a chat um essentially uh in terms of recommendations um We've got, you know, values based um, principles need to be developed, uh, a global security kind of infrastructure, um, which is supported by a platform, a digital platform. We need to invest and ensure in, in all of these things um, to create essentially a one planet health system uh, and to build leadership capacity uh, to actually deal with emergencies, um, including cultivating wise and courageous leadership. So th those are the, the key recommendations. Just to say the book was uh, launched uh, last year at the Interaction Council plenary meeting um, in Malta. Uh, it was very well received by these former leaders who've um, helped to push it out as well um, to current uh, leaders and think tanks. Uh, I welcome other opportunities to discuss it um, uh, um, with, with audiences of that sort. Um, the book is available on uh, a discount over April um, it, on Routledge, and it's also available on Amazon. Um, welcome follow up. Do email me. Um, and, you know, we can't take forward these recommendations on our own. We've got a seminar first thing tomorrow morning that's talking about essentially um, how many of these recommendations that came from the book are being taken forward. Um, and I'll be really keen to hear further suggestions um, and welcome uh, partnerships as well going forward. So thank you ever so much. Uh, I'll open it now to discussion. Uh, do follow up. I'll put my email address in the chat as well.
So thank you. So Chamika, do we have any um, any questions or patterns of questions? Uh, not in the chat box, but uh, thank you doc, so much, Dr. Joe. I think all the participants may unmute yourself for questions and comments now. Thank you. Could you put, do you mind putting my email address in the uh, chat box? Just yes, I'll wants. do that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so thank you. So yeah, just do uh, raise your hand if you want to uh, ask a question on screen as well. That'd be great. Thank you. So, so I'll just say a little bit of an introduction. Whilst if the, if there's not not any questions coming forward about the um, advancing recommendations and what we're doing, um, so in essence, um, we've already launched a, a global youth security council for existential threats. Uh, last year at the One Young World Summit in Belfast. Um, so that's being done in partnership with One Young World. Um, and working together, uh, they've now set up a, um, a Global Youth Security Council with 14 very talented um, leaders from around the world. Um, they meet monthly with myself and they're working on a strategic plan, which is being framed at the moment as Strategy X, um, which is about addressing existential threats to humanity. Um, and the the plan is to also then establish um, a global existential security threats board later in the year at the Interaction Council um, plenary meeting. Um, in the meantime, uh, as I've mentioned, um, oh, hello. Yeah. Go I'm sorry, Joe. There's a there are uh, there's a question on the chat box and uh... go 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 ahead. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah. Could uh, you read it? Sorry, I yeah. It. This question from uh, Talita. Uh, does public health education programs include uh, health security as part of the curriculum? Uh, she had uh, public health training, but uh, security was not part of the training. It would be nice to push it. Yes. Yeah, I quite agree. Um, thank you, Talita. And uh, nice to see you. So um, I think one of the key learnings, I mean, I've had a, 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 an unusual public health career and I've mainly been working in public health in non-public health organisations, especially in the latter part of my career. And in this perspective, the role of um, public health in enhancing global security is actually really critical and it's a critical driver that should be underpinning much of what's actually happening in our mainstream um, public health education and training so I think this is something that's really key to join up um, and uh, something I, I'd love to work with with you and I think uh, with colleagues from the World Academy of Art and Science who will be present tomorrow at tomorrow's meeting um, to talk about how we can actually influence uh, training uh, and workforce development across the World Academies. So thank you. Any other questions? Uh, is there a link on tomorrow's session? It's on the uh, World Federation of Public Health Associations website, uh, which, oh, I can see it's already being put there. That's brilliant. Thanks, Chamika. Uh, is there anything else before we close? So I think we've come to, to time. So I'll just say a really big thank you um, to everyone. Do There will be a web link on this. Do share it with people that you think are interested. Do get in touch if you are uh, keen to follow up. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll reconvene tomorrow to talk about how we deal with the bigger issues around existential threats. Um, so a big thank you, everyone, and take care.